Good afternoon and welcome to the first of this year's Psychology Department Speaker Series. I'm Dr. Frank Connor. I am the Psychology Department Chair. It is my honor to welcome to our stage uh, Sheila Schindler. <laughs> Sheila is a faculty member, an adjunct member in the uh, Psychology Department teaching social work. Sheila has her, uh, she's a licensed master social worker. She currently is in the pediatric team at Hospice of West Michigan. Sheila received her uh, bachelor's degree from MSU and her master's of social work is from Western Michigan University. Sheila. Hi, thank you. Well, hi, welcome. Um, welcome to Coping with Grief and Loss. Um, I'm really happy to be here to talk to you about this topic. I think it's an important topic because, well, it's a part of life. And I think everybody in this room will probably experience grief and loss once or many times in your life. I think there's varying degrees of this experience that we go through, but the truth is that if you're human, it's pretty unavoidable. Um, I think the only way to avoid going through grief and loss would be to not care about anybody or anything. And I think that's probably a pretty bad idea. So um, the good news is that there is a fair amount of research out there that helps us to understand ways to cope with grief and loss that will ease the suffering and pain and also possibly even bring about opportunities for good things to come from the loss. So that's what we'll talk about this afternoon. We'll look at the research and what it says and try to understand better how to approach grief and loss in a way that eases the suffering and pain and also maybe even creates opportunities for personal growth. So I think the best way to start would be to tell you about two of the families that I worked with in my career that really helped me to see the way we approach grief and loss can make a big difference in how we experience it. Um, first, I should probably explain what I do for a living. I am a pediatric hospice social worker for Hospice of Michigan. So this means I work with really sick kids um, and their families, sometimes at the end of life. And um, I also provide bereavement care for these families, sometimes for years after the loss of a child. And I have met so many incredible families and learned so much from them. But um, two of these families that I thought really helped to kind of show how the way you cope with grief and loss can have a pretty big impact on how you experience it would be uh, these two wonderful families that are both I mean, very strong families, fiercely loving, fiercely protective, but they approached it in such very different ways that their experiences were really different. So, okay, the, the, first, the first family um, was this fiercely loving, protective single mom. And she had three teenage daughters. Her youngest daughter was very, very sick. And um, this mom was a fighter. I mean, she's a single mom. So were her daughters. They were 16 and 19. But the 12-year-old uh, was really sick. So what this mom said to me was, even thinking about the possibility of my child not making it is like giving up on my child. I won't do it. I will not talk about death and dying. I don't want to even think about it. I'm going to punch cancer in the face. We all are. We're not going to give up. We're not even going to let death in the house, period. So, so she, can, can you blame her? I mean, she was just this really tough, strong mom. So um, one night, 
her daughter got really sick and uncomfortable. She was having trouble breathing. So they called 911 and um, the ambulance came and took her to the hospital and they put her on oxygen and she stabilized. So at that point, the mom said to her daughters, let's go downstairs, get some food. We'll come right back up, right back up. And then we'll settle in for the long haul to fight this through one more time. And um, so they, they went down to the cafeteria and they were gone, oh, 10 minutes. And um, there could be a lot of reasons for what happened, but um, I think sometimes when very sick people's adrenaline kind of goes down, they're comfortable, they're at peace, their body can crash, and that's, I think that's what happened. So she died very peacefully, very quickly. And, um, oh, oh the, the family came back up maybe 15, 20 minutes after they had gone downstairs, and the nurse had to tell them what happened. And um, it, was, it was so painful and traumatic. They were distraught. They were angry at themselves, I think, more than anything. They felt like they had let her down. They were angry at the hospital because the hospital said she was stable and they had gone down and and then they were angry at each other because there was some disagreement about going downstairs to get the food. So they, they separated and they went different directions to grieve. And it was so painful to, to see that and I think about them to this day. Um, okay, so around the same time, around the same time, I had another family, and this little family was on a farm, and they had four young children. So on a farm, it's very different, right? Like um, people, animals die, people slaughter animals for food, animals are born. Death is not something that's foreign. So this family talked about death right, right from the start. They did some wish trips. They talked about the possibility that he would, their 12-year-old would not get better. They talked about it with their four-year-old, six-year-old, and nine-year-old. And they were able to ask questions. They would had family photos taken. They had some wonderful memories. And then when he, he got very sick towards the end of his life, they, he was in a a hospital bed in the middle of the living room. And um, they did this favorite thing in the world. They made a camp out and they pitched a nice tent and they made a fire in the fireplace and they sang songs and they roasted marshmallows. And then as he got very close to the end, they all crawled into the bed with him and they held him and each other, and they, they talked to each other the whole time. And it was incredibly peaceful. It was still painful, but it was so peaceful, and it bonded them together. So, okay, how to put this into words? Um, I mean, it, it doesn't matter how strong the family is. I mean, both families were strong and protective and loving and doing the best they could. But there was a different way of coping, right? So um, the image that comes to me is that grief is like a wave and, um, or many waves. It kind of feels like waves if you've experienced it. Um, so when that wave comes at you, if you've ever played in waves, you know that you can, you can face a wave head on and be ready to fight it. <laughs> but if that wave is big enough, 
you know, the sand goes out from under you and you just get tossed and it's scary and you're battered and you're, it's really an unpleasant experience. You feel out of control. But if you know anything about waves, you know that when that wave kind of hits, comes close, you have the option of diving right into the heart of that wave and you know how you still get sloshed around, but you're, it's not battering. And you know that it's going to end. So there's this piece that if you hold on, it will, it will pass. So I kind of see approaching grief in a healthy way as kind of this, learning how these waves work and how to jump into them and become part of them rather than getting completely battered by them. So I, I hope that makes sense. Um, what I'd like to do is start learning about these waves now and the first step, the first step I think in doing that is to um, recognize the different forms of grief in our lives and the prevalence of it. So briefly, I think some of you have clickers, and I apologize if you don't. I got my hands on as many as I could. I think there's about 60 clickers out there, and what I'd like to do <laughs> is, and my students who are here know I do this a lot, <laughs> I like getting numbers. I like understanding what's going on in the room and figuring out what the experiences are in this room. If you've never used the clickers before, I'll talk you through it. Um, there's only four questions, and, um, and we'll, we'll get kind of a reading on the experiences in the room. So I have two student volunteers, so if they could come up quickly. Um, we will do this just the way they do it in class. <laughs> so here are the questions. We're going to get a sense for the prevalence of grief and loss in the room and then the intensity and look at how uh, there's different levels of intensity. So who's my writer? Okay, here you go. And then I thought when you pull it off, you could maybe, yep, yeah, maybe it'll stick there. There's four questions. So let's look at the first question here. So the first question before you vote, you can't you can't do it till I open the voting, but I do want to say a quick thing to clarify. Um, have you ever experienced the loss of someone very important to you? Notice it says important to you and not close to you because there's something called shadow losses that I would like to include here. So for example, if you've had a miscarriage or maybe a parent died that you never had a chance to be close to or um, in my own personal life, I was born into a family where my brother died shortly before I was born. So I grew up in a family where grief was kind of a big deal, but I never met him. He was important, but I wasn't close to him. So I hope that makes sense. So turn on your clickers by hitting the yellow button and you should see a welcome. I'm sorry if you don't have a clicker, but I still think it'll be interesting to get a reading on the room. So what I'll do is hit the green button up here. So A is yes, you've lost someone very important to you. B is no. Oh, 58, got a few. 59, okay, all right, any thoughts? I've, I'm, I have no idea, this is totally anonymous, I have no idea what the result will be, but let's find out. 
So 50 said yes and 9 said no. So 85% of the people in this room have lost someone close to you already. So then the next question is we're going to add other losses in life. We need to be aware of them in order for us to cope with them well. So other losses in life, death of a pet. I am a big animal lover, and I know that can be wildly painful. Um, another type of loss could be relationship, a bad breakup or divorce. Um, Sense of safety means if you've be, ever been in an accident, that kind of ruins your sense of safety. Uh, suddenly it's fear-inducing fear just to get in a car. Or if you've been diagnosed with a serious illness, or if you've been the victim of a crime, these are all different things that can create loss in life. So A is yes. B is no. If you said yes to the first one, you'll say yes again, because this is, you have experienced the loss of someone important to you as well as a different loss. Okay? So, here we go. So, okay, <laughs> we have 95% of the people in this room have had a significant loss, either a person or a different sort of loss. It's just being human, right? I mean, it is part of life. So hopefully, if you are grieving, you don't feel quite as alone, uh, and if you are not, you realize this is a very, very common human experience. Okay, so next, we're going to kind of look at, there's different intensity level to these grief experiences. So I'd like to check out how people are on their intensity level. Um, oops. I'm pointing it the wrong way. No? Oh, I have to click on this. There we go. Okay. So this next poll is to look at how intense it is for you. So at the time of the loss, how would you describe the intensity of your experience? Unable, like you had to take time off school and work. Moderate, yeah, you could get through a day, but you had to leave and go to your car and cry for a while. Um, or you're on no sleep and no food. Or life is definitely being much more difficult to get through. And then mild is it's pretty painful, but no change in daily activity. And then D is, I have not had a loss. So hope that makes sense. Let's find out. I will open it up. Wow, that's fast. <laughs> Good. Seven. OK, so A is very intense. B is moderate. Um, and that's 30. Okay, so A was 15, B is 30, C is 11, and then the two people who have not had a loss. So 26% of people in here have had that grief experience where it is all-encompassing, very intense, one in four. And then finally, one more question. This one is about today, how you are right this minute. So we're looking at how many people in here are having 
the experience of grief today, right now, sitting here listening to this, um, but also kind of paying attention to if it has changed over time. So, so how does that same loss feel now? How would you describe it? And we'll open it up. Go ahead. Okay, so only one has A, is A, very intense. Nine at moderate. 38 at mild. And then one at no loss. All right, so I will X out of that. Um, so hopefully you can see by these numbers, you're not alone. If you're in here and you have been grieving, um, something to notice that, look at the intensity of grief and how it has shifted over time for many people. So at first there were people, 15 said it was so intense that they had trouble functioning in life. And now that's down to one. Um, so it, 30 went down to nine. And 11 for mild went up to 38. So um, this is important because one of the points today is Grief doesn't necessarily go away, especially these very intense losses. Some grief can only be carried. Have you heard that, that quote? I really like that. Some grief cannot be fixed. It doesn't go away. It can only be carried. So today we're going to talk about how to do that in a healthy way. So here's a little bit of the research and what it says, and you can see it kind of falls in line with what we just saw. Most bereaved persons experience intense, time-limited periods of grief, 20 to 30 minutes at a time, but that varies too. So those are the waves that come. And then normal, oh, okay, normal. So you're not abnormal if this is not your experience. I prefer... <laughs> They call it complicated grief. So this is less complicated grief, not normal. But the literature says normal grief. Normal grief appears to occur in about 85% of persons following a loss. Largely subsides within a year or two. So that, that is pretty much what we're looking at with the numbers in this room as well. So, okay, let's start talking about this experience of grief and learning about it so we can cope better with it. First, we'll talk about what grief is, how it affects us, then we'll shift into actual ways to cope with it, research-driven, that can ease suffering and create possibly opportunities for personal growth from this incredibly painful human experience. So here's our terms, just so we're on the same page. Bereavement is the umbrella term for the loss of a loved one. Grief is the internal experience of the loss. And then mourning is the outward expression of the loss. All right. The experience of grief. So. Here's the big thing about this bio, psycho, social, and spiritual. When you're talking about grief, there's definitely a spiritual piece to it. Most people tend to think of grief as an emotional experience when, in fact, it is all-encompassing. It, it, it involves our whole beings. 
Uh, I had a mom say to me, it, she felt like she was hit by a truck. It's that physical. And if you think about how to describe grief, um, your stomach, right, that feels like wanting to throw up. There's a tightening in the throat. There's this ache and the need to cry, sometimes feeling like you can't stop crying. There's um, aches and pains, fatigue, irritability, anxiety, the heart is racing, um, maybe a feeling of unreality, maybe a feeling of relief. Many times there's a feeling of relief and giggling. That's okay too. It's a very confusing <laughs> experience. It also affects us socially as one mom said, she felt she lost her child and she felt like she had like this letter on her forehead that said, I lost a child, don't talk to me because you'll say the wrong thing. So she felt pretty socially isolated. So it can both socially isolate people but also bring them closer to some people who do understand the experience. Um, and spiritually, many people go through a lot of questioning as far as why would God do this? I thought I was doing everything right. Um, it can be a very disorienting experience where you, people have to reorient themselves to their spiritual beliefs. So I have a study to show you that's really interesting. Um, I want to Make sure you get this because grief is not just emotional. And this study shows how physiological it is, how it affects us in very physical ways. So the first part of the study focused on acute, like those waves that come at you. But the second part of the study is what I really want you to notice. There's all these different chronic background disturbances that last weeks to months. Notice, just for everyday functioning, there's de decreased concentration and agitation, inability to, uh, to have um, attention. There's restlessness and anxiety. Notice also all these system changes, cardiovascular, endocrine, which is our hormone system, which tends to regulate mood and behavior. So that's being affected. And immunologic changes, which means that people get sick a lot easier. So I think the, the point to be taken from this research is grievers, first, they're not crazy if they're exhausted and sick and physical. Second, they have to take care of their physical well-being as well as their emotional well-being because it is so all-encompassing, not to mention they're spiritual and they're social. So, okay. <laughs> so let's try to start making sense of this crazy emotional experience of grief and loss because it can be so confusing, and there's all these stage theories out there. Um, I'm not a big fan of stage theories because it kind of implies you're doing it wrong if you don't go through the stages. And um, my favorite, I do have a favorite stage theory. It's the two-stage theory. It is one where you believe in stages, and then two is when you actually grieve and go, there's no stages. This is just chaos. I don't feel like I'm moving from one thing to another. So, my favorite research. Okay, it's weird that I favorite research in grief, but this is my favorite research. This helped me make a lot of sense of how people progress through grief because this was done by uh, a researcher named Davidson. Um, and what he did was he tracked 1,200 mourners and he followed them through a two-year period and recorded common experiences. He didn't look for 
stage one, two, three, he looked for common experiences, so really just looking at patterns. So this is the typical patterns that people who are in grief will experience. Not for everyone. Everyone goes through these phases in different ways, but 85% pretty much go through what he has put into four phases of bereavement. Um, this is how people get through the first two to three weeks. So this peaks most intense the first two to three weeks of the loss. It's called shock and numbness. The number one emotion at this time is stunned, just stunned. And then that is punctuated by moments of flooding, intrusive thoughts, you can't maybe refocus, it's all the person thinks about is the loss. So notice it, it peaks in intensity right away and then again at the one year anniversary. People in this phase, if you are supporting someone in this phase, you know the old casserole thing is a really good idea. <laughs> they have time confusion. They have different kinds of needs that they aren't able to get for themselves, like food, sleep, just helping them make decisions, maybe possibly making decisions about the memorial service. It's a very confusing time where people go from stunned to overwhelmed to feeling numb. So this is shock and numbness. Phase two, uh, this hits right after shock and numbness. This, and you can feel all of these any time, but this is when they peak. So we're looking at from two weeks to about four months, that searching and yearning that people feel that pain and they're moving forward. The hallmark of this phase is energy. So people want to set up. They may be blogging a lot. They may be setting up memorials. They may be putting up scholarship funds. Um, going to support groups, talking to people. There's lots of support for them still. So this is an interesting, really interesting thing that Davidson came up with, that 81% of people in searching and yearning experience what he called bizarre experiences. Okay, <laughs> bizarre experiences are having visions of the person who's gone, hearing their voice, um, sometimes having things that feel like the person is close to them and communicating with them. So for example, this happened pretty recently. I, I talked to a mom and she had gone for a bike ride. And uh, she was in the woods and she stopped just for a minute and bizarrely, these two butterflies just sort of came <laughs> floating by and, and sat down on her handlebar and looked at her. And she was very baffled. And then they just sort of fluttered away. And then she realized, she, she said, as soon as she realized this, she was so filled with peace. But um, she, the daughter who had died was a twin and she realized it was to her it felt like both of these lost children had given her a message and that message was that they were okay and she had this flood of peace and calm. So another mom talked about looking up in the sky and she saw literally her son's face in the clouds not a shape that looked kind of like him but his face um, so I hear these things a lot. 81% experience it, not everybody, but it's definitely part of this searching and yearning and, and needing to be close. If you are supporting someone in this phase, then helping them not feel crazy, <laughs> just being present, uh, reminding them, 
one of the things we tend to do is say to people, oh, they're in a better place, and they're not suffering anymore. But that kind of implies they need to let go. Uh, maybe a different question to ask them is, when do you feel closest to who, their loved one? And they will tell you, when I'm in church, when, the, when I see a dragonfly. When, I mean, th it's different for everyone. So, so it's um, a very hard period, but high energy and searching and yearning. So, okay, phase three. This is a slog. Um, this is when most of the support systems have dropped off, right? Bills st still have to be paid. Um, it, it goes down at, at first and then peaks right around the fifth to the ninth month. Um, one woman said to me, and I think this sums it up, she said, I don't want to die, but I don't care if I wake up anymore. It's just this incredible fatigue. Um, if you're supporting someone in this period, don't forget about them. A lot of people don't check in after that fourth month. And this can be one of the most challenging times because of that. So um, it's also a period where the person is trying to reorganize their life. Things don't make sense anymore. The person they loved is gone. Like one dad, he used to play music with his son in a band, and he literally couldn't play his guitar anymore. He felt like he had to relearn chords. His fingers just wouldn't work. And I think that's kind of a metaphor for what a lot of people have to do. They have to say, OK, this person is gone, but the relationship is still there. The love is still there. What do I do with that? So this organization, depression, and disorientation. So finally, here's the good news. OK, the vast majority, 85% of mourners will get to this point. Um, it may occur sooner, but it peaks, as you can see, as time goes on, 18th to the 24th month. Energy starts to return. People go out and have a good time and come home and feel guilty because they had a good time. Maybe they woke up and it wasn't the first thing they thought about that morning. So reorganization is coming to a point where the grief isn't gone, but it's being carried in a healthy way forward, if that makes sense. And we'll talk more about exactly how to do that. So if, OK, my favorite research is at phases, because it helps give people some sense of where they're at and some, some understanding that they're not crazy. If that is sort of like a road map of how grief goes, the tasks of mourning by Warden are kind of the work, the work you need to do to get from one phase to the next. And he talks about the accepting the reality of the loss. Again, not in order. This can go all over the place. But to experience the pain of grief, adjust to the environment in which the deceased is missing, and find an enduring connection while going forward. I'd like to just talk about that second one for a second. So we're not, the research helps us ease suffering, but not take it away. If you feel pain, there are ways to cope with it that are healthy. There's also ways that are not so healthy, which we all do. And we'll talk about that too. But if you don't feel pain, that's OK. The research has changed on this. So some people who didn't feel pain, there was this big fear that they would have <coughs> delayed grief. But newer research shows that delayed grief doesn't tend to happen most of the time. If you don't feel pain, don't feel guilty. You're fine. If you do feel pain, then the problem comes if 
it's overwhelming and you don't have enough positive coping skills to cope with it. All right, so we're back to this. This to sum it up. Characteristics of normal grief. So most people have these waves of grief, 20 to 30 minutes that largely subside in a year or two. Here's where I really want to stress. <laughs> the number one predictor of normal grief is a social support system. And this theme comes up over and over again when you're talking about healing from trauma, healing from grief. And tonight, I'm going to put in a little plug, tonight over at Fountain Street Church, maybe you've heard, we're having the Diversity Learning Series has a wonderful speaker who is highly respected in the field of social connection, loneliness, and the impact that it has on human beings. So I highly recommend you go over there tonight as well and check that out. His name is... Kakiopo or Kachi? Kachi? Kachiopo? I don't know. <laughs> Kachiopo. It must be Italian? Okay. So, my apologies to Mr. Kachiopo if it's not the right way to say it, but there it is. So, normal grief really hel is helped by social support. So, now let's talk about the 15% who maybe don't have this experience. This doesn't mean they're weak, okay? This is huge. So people who have that, the 15% who struggle, here's the hallmarks of, of complicated grief. Pervasive sadness, it's constant. There's never a break. You are sad all the time. That would be a good time to get some help. The Feelings of self-loathing. So instead of feeling like I'm bad, you feel like, or I feel bad, you start to feel like I am bad. Self-loathing is another indication <coughs> outside help would be a good idea. And again, isolation and social withdrawal, um, big factor, big factor. Suicidal thoughts. So here's the big predictors of having that 15% of complicated grief experience. Poor social support, number one, right in there. Multiple life stressors include things like mental health issues, maybe an addiction, um, anxiety, depression, previous life losses, which can cu accumulate during a lifetime. So every time you lose someone in the present, it can bring back all these memories and emotions and trauma from a previous loss. And then the nature of the loss. So unfortunately, some losses are just traumatic. They're, they may be sudden. They may be violent. They may be of a child, or for a child, it may be of a parent. Um, there can be some sense of responsibility sometimes, like a parent who looks away for a minute and the child wanders into a pool. All of these things can complicate the experience of grief as well. So to put some words on these different kinds of grief, again, awareness is huge. Sometimes we just, we're in a culture where you're supposed to be strong. And if you're strong enough, you don't need help. And you can just get through it. And people don't want to hear about how you're really doing. Suffering is like noble. I mean, notice how we say people died after a courageous battle with cancer. I don't think suffering is noble. So here's how suffering looks that we should probably acknowledge and be very compassionate with ourselves and other people for. Traumatic grief, if the loss is sudden, violent, um, sometime, and sometimes it can come after a very long, long drawn out 
like the, the families I work with, sometimes their kids are sick for years and their, the illness is punctuated by trips to the hospital where all hell breaks loose and they think the child's going to die, the crisis passes and they go back. So it's this chronic stress that goes years at a time. Disenfranchised grief, um, that's grief that the larger culture, again, this is about social support, right? So disenfranchised would be maybe somebody's having an affair and the person dies. Um, suicide can be something people don't want to talk about, they don't understand it, and people can feel like that's not something they can talk about. Um, abortion in some cases can be this kind of grief. So disenfranchised, cumulative, we talked about. It just all accumulates over a lifetime. And finally, secondary losses, two forms of secondary losses. So say you lose a spouse, then you also lose a good parent, co-parent. You lose somebody who mows the lawn and does, does the finances maybe. You lose uh, your couple friends. There's all these secondary losses, these layers. And then there's those losses of anniversaries and birthdays and weddings. Um, so just to be compassionate to yourself, if this is something that you experience, it's real. And it can make the experience of grieving a, a lot more complicated over time. OK, so we all do this stuff. This, this is all about pain, right? It's all about coping with pain. So and I think about the wave when I look at this. Power over pain would be taking that wave on and wanting to fight it. Succumbing would be overwhelmed by the wave. And then escaping would be trying to outrun the wave. And I think. Maybe you can if the wave isn't big enough, but over time, these things can lead to isolation and more pain. So as long as it's not the primary pattern of coping, and we all do some of this, but if this is taking over and there is no other way to cope with the pain, and then it's time to get help. OK, well, so <laughs> here it is. The wave is coming. Um, how do we handle? Let's switch gears into what do we do? We've learned a lot about grief, kind of dissected it a little bit, seen it's a very common human experience. What do we actually do to cope in a healthy way that will ease suffering and, and create some opportunities even for personal growth? So here's the three goals for healing. Continuing bonds, finding meaning, and telling your story. We'll go into each one of these. Um, continuing bonds. Even our language to people kind of, it, it, it pressures them to move on, to detach, to let go, right? It's, they're in a better place, and, but you have your other kids. <laughs> You look so good. You're doing great. Um, we don't mean to kind of cut them off from this, but this is much healthier. The idea is the person's gone. The relationship is still there. So it's an adaptive response to bringing that person into your current life in a way that is new, a new normal. So some things you can do is talk to the person, not crazy, <laughs> talk to them, visualize them with you. Um, think about anniversaries coming up and plan for them, plan to recognize that person. The holidays are coming up, right? So if you are grieving, um, that can be a really challenging period of time. I recommend simplify life, draw boundaries around what you need and want, and, um, and take care of yourself as you bring that person into your rituals. 
maybe set it, put, put ornaments on the tree, you, it, however you celebrate, add new rituals, donate, like one family donated, they lost a five-year-old, they donated gifts for five-year-old kids to Santa Claus girls. So you find ways to continue that bond into the future. Oh, I had this one young woman who um, her sister died and she carried her picture down the aisle at her wedding because they, she would have been her maid of honor. I know. So it was such a beautiful way to keep her sister with her. Um, okay. Find meaning. So this is a quote right out of the research. Making sense of the event and finding benefits from the experience result in significantly lower distress and healthier outcomes. So there's two big ways to find meaning. One is called intuitive grieving, which is more going in. That's where you sit there and you contemplate how things are going. You try to turn it back into a world that makes sense, feels safe again, and where there's a feeling like of belonging. So intuitive grieving is very introspective. Instrumental grieving is doing things. Plant a tree, help other people, make donations, go for a walk to end cancer. Um, there, there are, oh, I had, oh, this was a sweet girl. She, um, this was a young girl who loved to give away clothes to kids in need, so they created Katie's Closet, and they, um, they had a, a room in the school where any kid who needed any kind of coat could just go in and take it for free. So that would be a way to find meaning but it results in significantly lower distress and healthier outcomes. Um, so one way to help you get to this point where you have continuing bonds and you find meaning would be to tell your story. So uh, this is where expressive therapies come in. And um, this means a lot more than just talking. You can join a support group. There, I've got a list at the end here of all kinds of support groups you can join, which can be fabulous, by the way. Um, you can do some writing, art, music, exercise, anything that tells the story and helps you process it. So this is something called Santre work. Um, I do this a lot with families because all ages seem to like it, including the parents. It's simply a tray of sand, and then I dump out this giant bag of miniatures. Um, so they create a story. This is created by a 17-year-old. This was actually the first, the first young girl that I worked with uh, 10 years ago. And uh, she, she hated me. <laughs> she was mad. She was, I, my students have heard this story. She was really tough to work with. She didn't want to cry. She didn't want to talk. But she would do art. And so this is her sand tray 10 days before she died. And how she explained it was this is her past her childhood, there was a little treasure chest in that cave and it was being protected by the wizard and the child. Notice she is not connected to the ground. She's in a separate, she didn't feel part of this world anymore. And notice the present is empty because she felt like she was in transition. And then in the future, she has this white-winged horse, which I don't know if it symbolized it to her, but to me that means going to heaven, something peaceful, white. Then she has kind of a fearful, I don't know if you can tell, that's a skull that that fearful creature is holding at the end. 
So she has this barrier, but if you notice past the barrier, there's a garden. This kid would never have told me these things. I don't think she knew she felt this way, but giving her this expressive way of putting it down gave her mom tremendous comfort because she was able to see her daughter actually kind of thought there might be something beyond. Um, and her daughter also, that was her book of writings. She dictated letters right before she died to her mom and her sister, telling them she was. So these are the things that people who are dying need to say in grief. Thank you for, I'm sorry for, I forgive you for, I love you, and goodbye. And so I just gave her prompts, and she finished the sentences, and it was so powerful. We had a volunteer put it into this decorative book to give to her family. So she's grieving her own death, but this applies to all grief and loss. It's tell the story in whatever way is comfortable to you. And then here's, here's hopefully those positive things that can come out of the experience. So we have post-traumatic growth syndrome. This research says that up to 100% of grievers experience these things. They just don't recognize it. So part of finding meaning is seeing this in life. I'm not saying grief and loss is a good thing, but good things can come from grief and loss. So these are some of the things to watch for as ways to make meaning. New opportunities. I've had families create new businesses uh, to help other families who are grieving. A mom makes um, Christmas ornaments with memor memorabilia from their child in the Christmas ornament. Um, new relationships as well as closer relationships and a connection to others who are not afraid to connect. Um, suffer or increased sense of one's strength and greater appreciation for life in general, as well as a deepening of spiritual life. It doesn't always happen, and frankly, it happens in spurts, and it may happen and then go away. <laughs> but you can always try to make meaning and keep it, keep it alive. Okay, um, so I'm going to start closing up here uh, so we can take some questions, but I have one more story. I know my stories, my class tells me this too. They're all sad. I'm sorry, <laughs> but hang in there. This one is not all sad, but um, okay. So this dad sums up everything I want you to take from this today. I just, in three words, so this was a really, really sweet, just a very kind dad. And um, his daughter was 14 and had advanced cancer and uh, been through all the treatments. But um, in remission, but then she had some headaches. And she went into the hospital to see what was going on. She had an MRI which showed that the cancer had spread to her brain. And um, it was in such a way that they weren't even sure she was going to make it home. So the hospital recommended she get a room and they would make her comfortable. She wanted to go home. We asked her what she wanted and she just kept saying, I want to go home. I want to see my mom at home. I want to see my sister and my dog. So here, here's the other piece. She would not go home by ambulance even because if, the, if she died in the ambulance, they would have to turn around. This is how strongly she felt. She was going home. 
So we wrapped her in a blanket, made her comfortable, and they lived about an hour away. So the nurse and I followed her um, as she as she went towards the home, and the parents were driving, and um, they made it. They tucked her in. She went to sleep. She was so happy. Her dog next to her. And um, the parents said to us, go ahead. Go home. We're all right. We'll call you if anything happens. Get some sleep. So the nurse and I headed home, and then uh, she called at about 7 in the morning. She was still doing okay. So at about 10 o'clock in the morning, the nurse and I went back up about an hour away, and we were coming towards the house, and um, we heard music, like really loud music, like ground shaking music, because they lived on this long dirt driveway, and I'm thinking, I'm going to talk to the neighbors. That's really rude. <laughs> they have no idea what this family is going through. This is not cool. So we finally get to her house, and okay, the house was on the right, and the driveway went straight through, and there was this big field on the left, and on the right was this girl, and she was wrapped in a blanket, and she was surrounded by her principal, and all the parents, and all her friends, and it was a mob. It was just a mob scene. And on the other side of the driveway was the entire high school band and they were just just jamming I mean the, the ground was shaking people were dancing and every now and then she would turn to the people around her and shout I love you guys and they would turn around and shout we love you <laughs> it was just like this Beautiful, magical moment. So the dad and mom took us into the house, and, um, and the dad looked at us and said, you know, when, when you left last night, I didn't think I could do this. I thought, I'm not a strong person. I can't handle this. Um, but then he looked around, and he said, now, today... I realized that even though I'm not strong, we are strong. We are strong. And those are the three words right there. Because I think that sums up the importance of supporting each other. You're not alone, right? And we saw through the clickers, it's a a wildly common human experience. There's varying degrees of intensity, but we all go through it. Working with people at the end of life has taught me there is nothing more important than our relationships and each other and our communities. And it's how we heal. And it's, frankly, I think it's why we're here. So... If if you're going if you don't feel strong, that's okay. Um, reach out, support other people, and support yourself. Tell your story, find meaning, continue the bonds. We're all in it together as a community, so we are strong. So thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions, and I'll stay after two if you want and talk about things that are maybe more personal. Any questions? I encourage you to reach out to different support if you need it. Um, oh, no. It's kind of a hard thing to ask questions about, right? It's personal, but and yes, Kelly. <laughs> right. How do you deal with the emotions you feel 
having to be terribly strategic? Oh, that's a great, yeah. I mean, I've struggled with that question myself. This is an ongoing theme in social work class, too. How do you provide support and take care of yourself? Well, at first I wasn't so good at it. I had some nightmares, I cried, but I get to see these beautiful experiences. I get to see people doing wildly loving, generous, connected things that help each other at times of crisis. And I've had families even take me by the hand and ask me to sit with them at the funeral in the family section. I mean, you, if you, if you can just be present with people in grief, it's not something we are often comfortable with. It's scary because it speaks to our deepest fears, right? So if you can just know you don't have to say anything, your presence is so powerful and the rewards of that. Like, I don't know if you've had the experience when my dad died, knowing people were at the funeral, made a huge difference to me. I never would have thought. But people came for me, not him. My people I worked with, it was, it was really nice. So being present, the rewards you get from connecting people with people who are probably pretty socially isolated. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't judge anything. I think I ask uh, mostly just a lot of open and ended questions and let people search that out for themselves. I certainly can't give them the answers. We do have a chaplain as part of hospice at Hospice of Michigan, and all hospices have a chaplain who is available to, again, non judgmentally listen because people feel guilty. They have a lot of guilt, a lot of fear, um, a lot of anger. And it, um, it can just help to talk it out with people that like sometimes at church, maybe it's not safe to question and be angry. Go to someone who's safe. And it's OK to have these questions and not know how it's going to resolve. The, tell the story. That's how you figure it out, is just healing. There's no magic wand. It's painful, but there. But many people do make it to this deeper spiritual awareness. I did when my dad died. I, I wouldn't be doing this work, if it weren't for, his death. So. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Everybody feels that, right? <laughs> right. That is a very common feeling. You can say that. I don't know if I can ask you how you're doing. What can I do to be helpful? Do you want to talk? Do you not want to talk? Either way is fine. So you're putting it back in her. And honestly, the most powerful thing I think people can do is just be present. Just be there. You don't have to say anything. Like, I, I tell my class this, wait, W-A-I-T. Why am I talking? 
Sometimes it's fine to just say, is it okay if I sit here with you? Or is it okay if I mow your lawn? <laughs> Make sure you're eating, help you pay bills, uh, get the, the bills written out. I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways to provide either tangible help or just presence. Compassionate presence is huge. You can't say any. I, okay, I, I went to a conference with Warden, this uh, guru on grief and loss, and my question to him was, I work with people who are bereaved all the time. What do you want me to know? And his one piece of advice was, if you're trying to put a Band-Aid on it, stop. It, there's no Band-Aid. And if you try, you're going to make the person probably pull away because they are not ready. So don't try to put a Band-Aid on it. Just let them tell you what they need. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much 